sure most of you have attended it or realize that I'm out of the training academy. We at least try to do two trainings a year that are around veteran services. Um, we had the Battle Act that was, that was enacted in 2012, and I, as a part of that, our responsibility is to respond to it. Unfortunately, with the Valor Act, we have a, a whole bunch of veterans that, that might not qualify specifically under that act um, and the regulations for that. So what happened as a result of that, we formed a committee saying, geez, we really want to help all veterans, not just veterans that are Valor Act qualified. And what is the best way as a probation service that we can do that? Um, so a group of us here today, um, in collaboration with veteran agencies and the community, sat down for months and said, you know, well, how can we make this connection not only to these Valor Act qualified people that come before the court, but those who may not be qualified under the Valor Act. Uh, fortunately, in Massachusetts, um, we have great services for veterans. We do a lot of great things in Massachusetts. Um, in the nation, we are, we are known for the services that we provide in Massachusetts. Um, our mission is to get those veterans to those services the best way we possibly can. Um, and from my understanding from the agencies um, the community that deal with veterans, Unfortunately, we are finding a lot of veterans returning home from combat that are finding themselves involved with the court system. Um, and along with the court system, there comes a whole, a whole lot of a host of things that, that could be intertwined in their lives or services that the veteran could need. So I ask you to kind of sit, sit today with an open mind, listen to some of the recommendations that we have that we're going to put before you. I know Commissioner Dolan is on board. Um, we're going to try to start a pilot here in this part of the state. The reason that we chose this part of the state is because we do great things already with veterans. There's great collaboration with the agency here. We thought, what, if, what this is probably the best place to kind of gain the momentum to, to go through the rest of the state and make sure that all of us are on board with the same mentality, the same mind frame um, when it comes to a veteran that comes before us. So I'm going to turn over to what I think is the most important part of today's presentation to our, um, our friends from the Department of Veterans Services that are going to talk about a battle line presentation. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I introduce myself, uh, I just would like to say, um, do we have any veterans in the courtroom today? First of all, I just want to start off by saying Happy Veterans Day. I know it's my man, but probably won't see you guys, so I think I just get So you don't know what I'm talking about. 
so you can't sit here and tell me how to get help. Well, they can't do that with us because every single one of us in the program are either family members of a veteran or we're veterans ourselves. Um, myself, I was in the Marine Corps for five years. Um, I got out in 2009, so not that long ago. So I definitely know some of the issues that other veterans are going through today. And, uh, So the battle line presentation was actually put together by Walter Reed, the Walter Reed um, Institute of Army Research. And the reason why they came up with it is, you know, just like the sign says, it's a special mental health consideration for returning veterans. Because even though they're veterans, but every single one of them, they think differently, they react certain different ways, and it's also good because it helps the non-veterans or the family members of the veterans to get a better understanding of why the veteran acts a certain way, what makes them tick, how come he gets so aggravated, how come you know she doesn't want to be around anybody at certain times, how come the veteran doesn't want to be around crowds. And today is actually a special treat because usually it's only one of us that does this presentation. But you can, as you can see, it's two of us up here. That way you can see the similarities and differences between the both of us as far as our, our experiences. All right, uh, this is a picture of myself when I was in the Marine Corps. Uh, I'm not, I didn't put this up here so you guys can see this beautiful smile that God blessed me with. Uh, <laughs> it was actually to show you this is how I was about five, six years ago. That was me. Probably about 20 pounds heavier due to my girlfriend, but oh well. Uh, just to give you a little background about myself, uh, before I say this, please don't throw anything at me. Uh, you know, keep your pens and pencils to yourselves, but uh, I'm actually from New York. Uh, I, I kind of figured that. It's just turned into a one man show. So, <laughs> so uh, yes, I'm from New York. I was born in Jamaica, Queens, New York. Uh, but as a baby, my mom moved to Haiti, so I lived there for nine years. So I lived in a third world country, um, especially during the coup. So I saw a lot of things as a child growing up, um, things that a nine year old or a seven year old shouldn't be seeing. Um, age of nine, I moved back to New York, went to school and everything. Of course, the language barrier was tough and uh, ended up learning English in less than three months because I couldn't take the teasing anymore. So uh, by the time I was 17 when I graduated high school, looked at my mother and told her that I was gonna join the Marine Corps, which I did. She didn't like the idea because the first thing she said was, you're gonna get sent to war and you're gonna die. It's like, well, it's either I stand on the street corners on Jamaica, Queens, New York, which one would you want? Because we don't have the money for college. We don't have anything like that. So to make a long story short, joined the Marine Corps, three months in boot camp, which was hell, of course. After that, I went to Meridian, Mississippi, which is where my MOS school was, which is 7041, Aviation Operations Specialist. And again, not every single Marine is a grunt. There are some small ones out there, too. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> is that so, right, Russo? Uh, so with that being said, uh, after my three months in Meridian, Mississippi, I spent, after that, I went to Pensacola, Florida for nine months, which is where I had to learn the rest of my school. So I spent the whole year in that one school altogether. So that's why I had to sign a five-year contract. So from there, I went to Okinawa, Japan. I was in charge of 13 C-130s by the age of 18 years old. I was in charge of aviation safety. So that was a lot of responsibility for such a young, for, for such a young guy. And uh, while I was in Japan, we probably deployed to about 10 different countries. We mostly did humanitarian missions in the Philippines. Um, we did um, some training with, with Korea, so I was there for about three months. And we did the earthquake you know, relief in, um, in Indonesia. So I've, I've been a bunch of places by the time I was even 20. Um, after Okinawa, I checked into my new squadron, which was HMN 268 in Camp Hamilton, California. I checked in, the sergeant major says, all right, you're good to go. You know, you've got two sea service deployments, you're already an NCO before you're 21. All right, he was like, but before I let you go, I'm going to need two things from you. One of them is that we're deploying to Iraq in six months. And I was like, wow, thank you. That's, that's so nice of you. And the other one was that he needed me to get my aerial observer qualification before we leave. Now, mind you, it takes about a year, year and a half for you to get it. 
So throughout the whole six months, all I did was study. I didn't even get a chance to enjoy the beautiful sunny San Diego side. So that wasn't good at all. Uh, but that wasn't the worst part of the whole experience. The worst part of the experience was actually them telling you that as a 20-year-old that you have to sign a will before you deploy because you have to do all that paperwork. And I'm like, wait a minute. So you mean to tell me I could die while I'm out there? And they were like, no, it's just precautionary measures. And I was like, okay. And then they make you take pre-deployment leave, which is 10 days. And it's like, wait a minute. So you want me to see my family before I leave? So I might really not come back. But then they were like, nope, don't worry about it. When we got to Iraq, we were tasked to do the Kazakhstan missions, which is basically we were first responders, kind of like the firefighters. So whoever got hurt, we had to fly out and go pick them up. So I saw everybody from children, women, even some of our own, unfortunately, some of our own service members. Um, when I came back from Iraq, within two weeks, I got a DUI. And the reason why is because when I came back, I was having all these issues. I didn't know how to handle it. Plus, being 21 and already being an E5, a sergeant, I had a lot of responsibility for the guys I worked under. So I didn't tell anybody. So all I did was drink, 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 and drink. Pass out, wake up, go to work get off work, drink, just keep doing the same thing over and over again. So when I got the DUI, <clears throat> come to find out that I passed out behind the wheel. The way I found that out is because when the EMT came, she looked at me, she said, you got out of that wreck? And I was like, yep. And she was like, well, you're lucky to be alive because if you were conscious when that happened, I would have tensed up and I probably would have been in a full body cast. So uh, with that being said, the cop came, looked at me and he said, you know, we're gonna have to do a field sobriety test. I looked at him, I was like, you know, just give me a breathalyzer. Gave me the breathalyzer and it was a point two three. <laughs> three times over the legal limit. So with that being said, then he started giving me the, the speech. Oh, you know, I was a Marine, you know, this, this and that, you know, you just came back from Iraq and you know, you, you, you know, you could have died out there, but you came home and you did this, what's wrong with you? When I was a Marine, I didn't do anything like this. I wasn't this stupid. And I looked at him, I said, well, I probably never deployed either. He didn't like that answer. <laughs> Next thing I know, my head is on the hood of the car, handcuffs. And it goes to show you how much I didn't care. When he put me in the back of the car on the way to the police station, I took a nap. It's like, hey, I know where I'm going anyway. So after that, I spent three days in jail, which was the worst three days of my life. Got out, called my captain, told him what happened, got a lawyer, and got everything taken care of. But that wasn't the wake-up call. I just kept on drinking, kept on drinking. The wake up call was when one day we were cleaning, we were doing field day, and I was moving my wall locker and I heard some clink, 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 clink behind it. I opened the drawers, there was about 20 empty liquor bottles there. So come to find out, every time I got drunk, I used to hide the bottles there for, for no reason, I don't know why. So that's when I got the help that I needed. And uh, when I got the help, it really, really helped me out because I ended up finishing up my, my Marine Corps career. But when I got out, it was in 2009, and the economy tanked at 2008. So I spent eight months without a job. Went down to the career center and asked me if I was a veteran. I said, yes, I am. They told me to go meet the vet rep. Sat down with her, told her my story, and she said, oh, okay, well, let's look at what we can find for you. The first job she pulled up was this one. I applied for it. A few weeks later, got an interview. <coughs> When I got the interview, it was actually the undersecretary at the time, Coleman Nee, but now he's actually the secretary. Throughout the interview, he looked at me, he said, you're gonna be working long hours, you're gonna be having people's lives on your hands, you, 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 you're gonna get paid less than everybody else with the amount of work that you do, but just to let you know, I can find another job for you that's less stressful and pays more. It's like, wait a minute, are you trying to hire me? You fired me already, I just got here. So to make a long story short, I got a, couple, I got a call a couple of weeks later they told me I got the position. I've been here ever since going on three years. Now this better look at fellow right here. <laughs> <laughs> this picture right here is uh, two days before my 25th birthday. Eight months prior to that, I was a mailman. Um, and I left the federal job and went to go do my dream of a Marine before it got too late. I, um, my first med pack was in February 2006, and my second one was August 2006. Um, I was hit by IED, uh, shrapnel damage, I, um, 
of Germany, and they, every stop that I made, they gave me a bag of Percocets, and that's where this whole journey for me started. Um, I decided to go back to Iraq, and my God, I gotta keep fighting on pain medication, which isn't allowed. Um, we're just, we're gonna fast forward through all that, actually, and when we get to 2009, when I get out, um, I leave the Marine Corps with a prescription of Oxycontin at 80 milligrams four times. story is that I prayed the night before for help because I couldn't do this alone. I didn't like that answer, but um, that was the, that was the beginning of, of this journey for me. I, I sat in the middle of the house corrections for 90 days. That's where I detoxed. I um, got a call to go down for an attorney visit. And the, the gentleman with a dog and a cane and a suit. This guy's not my lawyer. His name's Kevin. He's with the Department of Veterans Services. He's here to see if he can uh, help you out with it. So a couple more months, they um, get me embedded in the beach program in Brockton. And, uh, I went through a double round of that treatment. I went from there directly to the PTSD program in Northampton, and from there to a transitional residence. I spent a year trying to get my life back on track. I did it without relapse. I think it was over three plus years. And so Kevin, who was the director of special populations, uh, I used to call him to check in and say, hey, you know,
He does not leave your side, and you don't leave his side. I could wake up at 2 in the morning and I say, hey, I gotta go use the head, and he's there with me. So that's exactly why I mean, a lot of these veterans, they, a lot of these veterans, when they come back, it's hard for them to actually break that cycle because of the fact that that person who was there with him for the eight months, you know, a year or a year and a half, is not there anymore. That's why if you go into a room where it's a whole bunch of civilians and one veteran, he's usually in the back corner, not talking to anybody. But if you go in a room full of veterans, you better have some air mouse on because there will be some nasty stories being said.
be honest with you, if it wasn't for the alcohol, I don't think I would be here right now. I would have probably did something really, really rash and ended up who knows where. And uh, when it says me feeling easily strong or anxious, that goes with a lot of veterans. I myself, I have a few examples. One of them is when um, I'm driving on the highway. Now, because of all the helicopters I was around and the blasts and stuff like that, I have ringing in my ears. I have tinnitus. Now, if you guys ever been outside of a plane or a helicopter, they usually turn on the APU, which is the alternate power unit. And it sounds like, kind of like the ringing in your ears. One day I'm driving, windows were down, nice day out, my ear starts ringing. And the next thing you know, a truck hit the Drake, the, the Jake brakes. All I heard was a day ringing in my ears and the truck going And it brought me back to those days when I was on the helicopters. Next thing you know, I swear, I'm on the side of the road, I'm leaning against the tire and I'm hyperventilating. So those things really, it's just triggers that a lot of veterans go through. You might see a veteran who don't even want to stop at tolls. They just go right through it. And the reason why is because probably while they were in Iraq or Afghanistan, they probably got ambushed at a checkpoint. So it's just all those things that you have to keep in mind. Now, I got a funny story just the other day. On Halloween, it was night, nighttime. I'm driving, my girlfriend's in the car. And from the corner of my eyes, I saw a flash. Next thing I know, I'm stepping on the gas. I'm doing 80 in a 45 mile an hour zone. And she's yelling at me, slow down, calm down, stop. Stop, stop. And the reason why I did that was because when I saw the flash through the bushes, I automatically, automatically, automatically brought me back to the days when we were flying at night and we had the night vision goggles on. The only thing you could see was the flash. That's when you know somebody was shooting at you. Transitioning to combat space, tactical awareness. Combat requires alertness and sustained attention. Back home, it takes time to learn to relax. Lethally armed versus locked and loaded at home. In combat, soldiers carrying their weapons at all times is mandatory and necessary. At home, soldiers may feel a need to have weapons on them in their home and their car at all times. They may believe that they and their loved ones are not safe without them. And the reason why is because when you're in combat, you literally have at least 80 to 100 pounds of gear on and they literally drill in your brain that without your rifle, without any type of weapon, you're nothing. The whole time I was in Iraq, I had to carry an M16 with me. And I had about, <coughs> so about two to three hundred rounds on me the whole time. Not only the M16, but I had to carry a side pistol, not a millimeter. And that was only when I was, when I went to sleep, when I went to eat, even when I had to go use the bathroom, you had to take it everywhere with you. That's exactly why when they come back, it's easier for them to actually have some type of weapon with them because it makes them feel safe. Because while you're in combat, not having those type of weapons, not having any type of weapon, you literally feel naked. I mean, when I came back from Iraq, it used to take me about two to three hours just for me to get ready in the morning. Because when you come back, you have to turn all your gear in. You have to turn all your, rif your rifles, you know, your, um, your, your vest, your, your Kevlar, everything. You have to turn everything in. So I used to get out, I start walking, I'm like, oh man, what am I forgetting? I run back inside and I'm like, wait a minute, I don't need that anymore. It was back and forth for like two hours straight, nonstop. I, um, first thing I did when I got home was I, I went to Oceanside, California, to Hindsight's, and I bought a 45 caliber stone nose concealable pistol. It was the first exact thing I did. I went to the bank, took cash out. And I've been an avid gun collector. I've bought guns since I had my first firearm at 16 years old. Um, my now ex-wife, we, we were sleeping one night. The pistol was locked in the drawer where it always was, um, always chambered, ready to go. Because in my eyes, there's no point in having it not ready to go. Um, heard a crash in the other room, broken glass. I jumped out of bed, grabbed the pistol, and as I was running around the corner of the bed, I ended up tripping and catching the corner. I ended up discharging around through the wall. It was an apartment complex. Like there was people that lived on the other side. And it was a mirror. Nobody was breaking in. And 
my reaction to that, I could have killed somebody next door without, obviously not malicious, but just because I woke up in, in that panic. And that's exactly what the law of the that it almost stands for me. Transitioning to combat skill, armed. And combat is dangerous to be unarmed, and at home is dangerous to be armed. Emotional control versus anger and attachment. In combat, controlling emotions during combat is critical for mission success. At home, failing to display emotions or only showing anger around family and friends will damage the soldier's relationships. The soldier may be seen as, as detached or uncaring. Now, from my experience, when I came back and I was having all my issues, I probably spent about six or seven months without talking to my mom. And back then, it's not that I didn't want to talk to her. It was just because I just didn't want her to look at me any different. You know, I still want her to look at me as the child that you know she raised, the, the, with the man that I am now. So with, throughout the whole time I spent not talking to her, I didn't realize how much it was actually affecting her. And the day that I finally called her, she started crying. And she's like, oh my God, I thought you were dead, this, this, and that. And when she said that, that's when everything clicked. It's like, wow, this is not all about me anymore. There's other people that I'm hurting throughout this process. I'm going to touch on this one. I'm actually dealing with this as we speak right now. Right in this minute. I'm, I'm detached. I haven't done a battle line in, in probably a year. These are very difficult feelings to talk about, especially to a crowd of two strangers. I mean, I'm sitting up here, I can hear my own heart on my two ears right now. I was fine before this time. But I'm reliving either what he's talking about in, in my mind or what I'm trying not to say. You know, I feel vulnerable up here. And these experiences are so hard to put behind when you sit here and you talk about them. So I'm sorry for being a little withdrawn on this video. But that's what I'm dealing with right now. I feel completely detached because I'm reliving parts of this in my head right now. I'm like sweating bullets up here. And that's. <laughs> And, and that's what I meant by similarities and differences. So now, with him, it's hard for him to talk about it to a, to a bunch of strangers. But with me, it's fine. Because 90% of the time, I probably won't see you guys in another year, or I probably won't see you at all again. But when it comes to my own family, even my girlfriend, who I've been with for two years, we've been living together for, for a whole year, some of these issues I have, and I'm talking to you guys about, even though I didn't really get into detail about some of the things I've been through, she has no idea. It's every day she'll come up to me and say, hey, did you know last night you were fighting in the sleep? Like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. I just keep moving. But I know why I was. But I just didn't, I just don't want her to look at me and just, you know, think that, you know, there's something wrong with me. Even though the funny thing about it is she's a nurse. But I just don't talk to her about all those things. So that's why you can see the, the differences. And with him, it's uncomfortable for him. But with me, it's easy for me to talk to you guys about it. But when it comes to close friends and family, I don't talk to them about any of my situations. You want to protect them. You exactly. You don't want to put that pain and that burden on them. Because a lot of veterans, they always say the same thing. I, don't, I feel like I'm a burden. With what I'm going through, I'm going to deal with it myself. And I don't want to burden anybody else. But the crazy part about it is, a lot of veterans, once we get all overwhelmed, we don't want to deal with anything. We shut down. Like, I suck at paying bills because it's like I gotta remember to do this, I gotta give this person my money, I gotta give that person my money. So now every single time I get paid, I just give my girlfriend all the, all the money. It's like, hey, you take care of it. Because at the end of the day, it's my money, I earned it. So why do I need to give it to you? So that, those are the smallest things that gets that, that are overwhelming. Emotional control. In combat, controlling emotions is necessary. At home, limiting emotions leads to relationship fires. Uh, in, in combat, I mean, I, I have five names on my mind, my friends that are never coming home. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've been standing next to somebody when they get shot, and you're not allowed to stop and help them. You know, you have to continue with your mission, not let your emotions get, uh, my friend's bleeding right now, right there, right now, and I can't stop them. You've got to just keep your mission oriented and keep moving forward. Keep that emotional control over the situation, and then deal with it when you get home. Now, while I was in Iraq, uh, the CO called me in his office. Now, mind you, I'm in a combat zone, and the commanding officer's called me in his office. 90% of the time, there's something bad. 
it's never good. He's not going to say, hey, good job. Thanks, thanks for your hard work. First thing he said was, you got a Red Cross message. It's like, what? Next thing I know, I'm running out of the office. Call my mom. She picked up. I'm like, oh, thank God. It's not my mother. I'm like, hey, is Patrick OK, which is my brother? And she was like, no, he's fine. And I'm like, well, why did I get a Red Cross message? She told me that my father died. The first thing I said was, man, that sucks. And then I was like, all right. Went back to the CEO's office. He said, hey, we're going to send you home. I said, no, not happening. I was so numb. It was just the only thing I cared about was the, the guy who was next to me for the whole six, seven months. It's like, you know what? Because if I leave, something happens, I won't be able to live with myself. Not in the same place and at the same time or any different MOSs. Same exact way. Individual responsibility and guilt. In 
combat your responsibility is to survive and do your best to keep your colleagues alive. At home, you may feel you have failed your buddies if they were killed or seriously injured. You may be bothered by memories of those wounded or killed. So now, just like I said earlier before, when my father died, the CEO literally had to force me to go to the funeral. But the only way I was thinking was, he's dead already. There's nothing I can do about it. And he literally had to write orders for me to go to the funeral. The next day, I was on the C-130. Next thing you know, I'm on a commercial flight going back to New York. And when I got there, believe it or not, I was miserable. It was the worst 10 days of my life. Because throughout the whole time, the only thing I was thinking of was, OK, I hope everybody else is OK. I hope nothing happened to them. I, I, I hope that you know um, my buddy who's there, I hope somebody else has his back. Because if something was to happen to him while I was gone, I would have felt like it was my fault. Now, even though I had no choice in the matter as far as me leaving, the commanding officer told me to go. I had no choice. But in my mind, I would still feel that it was my fault. And a lot of veterans, you will see a lot of them, it's not that they have tattoos just like Don here, or they're wearing a black bracelet. That black bracelet usually has the name, the rank, the date that the person's born, and the date that they die. And that's somebody that lost their lives in combat. So don't, that's another thing you don't ask. Don't ask them about the bracelet either, because if they want to tell you, they'll tell you. The, the guilt piece is something that I, I work with with my therapy team on quite a bit. It's, um, it's, it's never going to go away. I think it will get better. I, um, I was getting ready to step off on patrol, and I get ready to get my guys briefed up, and uh, my platoon commander, Staff Sergeant Gomez, he looks at me and he said, Gary, when was the last time you slept? And I, I couldn't give him an answer. I looked like hell, I was tired, exhausted, hungry. And uh, he gave me an order to ground my gear and that he was going to take my patrol. You know, it's not one of those things you can really argue with. And so I gave him the gear that he needed for the patrol. And not three minutes later, did they step outside the wire and you heard one shot. Um, a horrible shot, but shot him through. So he shot him through the backside and it ended up coming out the front and taking the, the rest of them off. The guilt that I still hold for that, you know, I, I had to, to contact him and go out to California and visit him and say, say, Crystal, like, you know, I, I'm bothered by this and I'm so sorry that that, that was my patrol that you took. And again, we're filming, so I can't say exactly what he said, but never thought of it that way whatsoever. But I hold that guilt to this day, even with his permission to not hold that guilt. I still can't let go. Transition to combat skill. Responsibility. In the heat of battle, soldiers must act. They must make life and death decisions. Later, it's learning from these decisions without second guessing. Non defensive versus aggressive driving. In combat, unpredictable, fast, rapid lane changes, straddling the middle lane, keeping other vehicles at a distance, designed to avoid IEDs and VVIEDs. IEDs are improvised and explosive devices. At home, aggressive driving leads to speeding tickets, accidents, fatalities, soldier may be chasing, and adrenaline high are often getting while driving. So now, with the driving part of combat, when you're in a convoy, there's not that much space between you and the other vehicle in front of you. And there's no stopping. Because the reason why is because the longer you take, the more time the enemy has to actually figure out what you're doing and they can plan an attack. That's why everything is fast and unpredictable. <clears throat> so now, if you're driving on the highway, you see a car with, with a veteran's license plate, and they're straddling the middle lane, basically taking two lanes all at once. The reason why is because in Iraq, the way they used to disguise the IEDs was put a pile of rocks on there on the side of the road, or trash, whatever the case might be. So they were usually, they were usually, usually bombs under that. So as soon as the car hits it, boom, that's it. So that's why a lot of veterans, if you see them driving on the highway, there's like a trash bag or something. They're like swerving all over the place. Because if it was in the middle of the road, then it would have been a trash bag covering it or some type of trash. So that's why a lot of them, 
everything's always fast, unpredictable, and everything. Also, when you're in a Humvee, you have a driver and an A driver. The A driver is the one that's supposed to keep an eye out for you if something's happening. Till this day, I still do this, and not realizing it until my girlfriend brought it up to me the other day. Now, mind you, if I'm the A driver, my job is to look out to see if a car's coming, and your job is to just drive. So she's driving, we come up to a four-way intersection, she's making a left turn, I'm like, clear right. And she's like, she starts looking. I'm like, clear right, go. Well, no, well, I'm not, I, I, I'm not, my mind doesn't work like that. So now I'm starting to get aggravated because I'm like, okay, so now you don't trust me. If I'm telling you to go, why don't you just go? Next thing you know, that's what they did something. He gets mad with her though, it's over there. That, that pause or that, that, that uh, delay in making a decision to get killed. So he, he, he gets mad at her, saying, hurry up, let's go, just because that's the way he's trained. That's, that's what works for him. That's what's kept him alive. And in my mind, it's like the longer you take, the more time the enemy has to actually get to you. Now, mind you, we're, you know, we're like Duxbury or something. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> there are no enemies out here. So calm down. It's just like, oh, she's mad. So now we're sitting So there may be facing an adrenaline high, which is true. Because while I was in Iraq, like I said, our job was to do the cast back missions. Kind of like a firefighter. As soon as that bell goes off, it's like, all right, it's time to go do our job. Put on our gear, hop on the helicopter, go ahead and get there as fast as we can. So that adrenaline was always with me 24-7. So when I came back from Iraq, I went and bought a motorcycle. I didn't have a license. I didn't care. Did I know how to ride one? I learned the hard way. <laughs> Took a couple of bumps and bruises. But, be, but ever since I get on the motorcycle, that, that adrenaline high, for some reason, calms me down, which is weird. It's like because, a drug. Yeah. It really is. Like, there is nothing that makes your blood faster than being shot at. Someone trying to kill you, your bullets fly by your ears. <clears throat> like, there's, there's no way you can ever feel that rush. Yeah. Okay? Maybe it's sick, but it's, it's, that's the one thing I miss is that rush. So that's why a lot of veterans, they never do the speed limit on the highway. They're always going fast. It's like, where are you going? No, I'm just going to do my life. It's like, okay, why do you need to go 90 when it's still 65 miles an hour zone? But that's just how their mind works. Transition to combat. So, the combat driver and combat driving fast is necessary to avoid danger. Back home, driving fast feels right, but it is dangerous. All right, last slide. Discipline and order versus conflict. Survival depends on discipline and obeying orders. At home, with flexible interactions, ordering and obeying children and friends often lead to conflict. So now, I was showing we had some kind of internet connection here because there was actually a video I wanted to show you. And the video is actually a drill instructor and his platoons were about to graduate marching. So from day one, that's where the discipline and ordering come from. A lot of people think that when you see a platoon of guys, about 90 guys marching to what one guy is saying, oh, that looks nice, everybody's in tune, this and this and that. The reason why is to instill in you the instant obedience to orders. So whoever the leader is, if he says left, your left foot has to hit the ground. If he says right, your right foot has to hit the ground. If he says column right, everybody has to turn right. So now, think about this. So imagine that platoon, right? That one person is calling it, everybody's in step, everybody's in motion, and he says column right, and one person decides to go left. Everything gets messed up. And that's where marching comes from. Because in combat, if I say left flank, we're, we're, we're getting fired on the left flank, and the, the guy turns right, it's too late. So that's where the discipline and the order comes from. And to be honest with you, I, I, I do think that us Marines, we have the best discipline, but that is. <laughs> does not exist within families. Now, this is the only one I really don't agree with, but the doctors came up with it. And the reason why is because there's always a clear chain of command within families, right? Can anybody guess who that is? Mom. It's the wife. <laughs> it's, it's the person that you're with, because whoever, whatever she says, 90% of the time, you're gonna do it, because a happy wife is a happy home. But that's just me. So, <laughs> with that being said, that is it.
has um, health veterans, but it comes at a lot, a lot um, stronger cost than it does to us that have not been involved in the military. Um, they continue to give back despite the fact that it does uh, drain them and can cause emotional uh, turmoil sometimes. But um, we do understand and we do want to help these people, and, and the reason we bring them here is because this is the face behind the veteran. These are just two stories, but um, the people we serve have, everybody has their own different story in, in, in any way we can help. Regardless of what their story is, the creation, I'm sure we can make a connection and help. We'll take a quick 10 minute break. They're going to stick around just for a few more minutes just to uh, entertain any questions you might have on the side, um, and then we'll get on with our presentation. Okay, thanks again to uh, John Burke and Mark for their presentation. It's a great encapsulation. If you haven't been in the military, um, you know they, they, they do a great presentation, trying to kind of show you like, this is where a veteran has been and how does that play when they get home. So nice presentation. Could be really emotional for them. Um, so appreciate their time to do that. This afternoon, or further this afternoon, uh, we'll talk about some community support options that are out there for us as probation officials. We have Steve Connors. He's with the Central Hampshire Veteran Service Office. Uh, great guy, a lot of knowledge, a lot of information. Uh, very helpful as part of our committee in helping what we have today for you. Um, we're also going to hear from Dominic Sandrini, who's with Soldier On. I think a lot of us are familiar with Soldier On. We probably had people on probation that have been referred there, come from there, told us about it. Also, we have Marie DeMary and John Levin. Sorry, this young. Um, and they're from the Veterans, well, Maria is a Veterans Justice Officer, and so they work with the VA, and they make a lot of uh, connections for us, for probationers, to other, uh, other areas. So, with that being said, I'll turn it over to Steve Thomas. Thank you. Hi, folks. Um, everybody here live in Western Mass? Okay, how many people know who the veteran service officer is in their town? Oh, doing better than work. Yeah, usually I get one hand that sticks up. See, just as a side note, in their packages, we did list um, all the veteran service officers that have Excellent, excellent. Okay, what is a veteran service officer? The state of Massachusetts decided to pass a law to treat the veteran and his dependents or her dependents as a special population and have a program called Veteran Services. It exists in other states, but usually in other states it's either county-wide or regional. Massachusetts is the one that says every city and town has to have a Veteran Service Officer. So that's why I asked if you knew who they were or if you knew you didn't have them. Because guess what? There's a whole lot of veterans that don't even know they have them. Um, I'm a veteran. You have to be a veteran to be in this position. Uh, I am a veteran. And when I got out, I met my veteran service officer. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, at the time, I think he was dating my sister, my older sister. Um, but the veteran service officer, I went and met him. And he wanted my discharge papers. And he was going to put it on file. And I said, great. Is everything going all right? And I'm like, well, I've got some problems. Oh, go see you. So I went to see the secretary. And she goes, yeah, you, you, are you having issues? And I said, well, no, not really. I guess I'm all right. Because the secretary turned out to be a woman who lived around the corner for me. I wasn't going to tell her what my problems were. So that's what he was in. And although he was a really nice man, he wanted nothing to do with talking about my problems or what I was going to be facing. So, when, but, put on a hell of a parade, great ceremony. Ten years ago, the mayor of Northampton, because at that time I was just the veteran service officer of Northampton. So, ten years ago, the, actually, probably ten years ago this week, I had just gotten a promotion at my other job. The mayor calls me up and says, you want to be the veteran service officer? And I chuckled and I laughed and I said, are you kidding me? I said, I'm not very good at it. You know how they were talking about everybody's got to turn right when they're supposed to go right and nobody goes left? I'm that idiot that went left when I was in the service. I said, I'm not very good with marching. I'm not very good with any of the 
uh, ceremonial stuff with veterans. So that's not, you, you don't want me. And she goes, well, no, actually I do because I know your background and I need somebody who's going to reach out to the homeless veterans in the city that are living along the river, the ones that are in trouble <coughs> with the law, the ones who are panhandling at Main Street. I need somebody who knows, who can learn and figure out what to do with these guys and women. So it took a couple months, she finally talked to me and I took the job. Um, when I started, we were assisting 14 people here in the city of North Angleton. Uh, nine years later, we generally assist financially 170 to 180 veterans or their dependents on a monthly base, basis here in the city of North Angleton. We also have grown into 10 communities. So going right along Route 9, you start at Pelham, Amherst, Hadley, Northampton, Williamsburg, Goshen, Cummington, Bang of Left. We got Worthington, Chesterfield, and Middlefield. Um, I am the director. I have a full-time secretary. I have a deputy veteran service officer who is sitting way over at the end. His name's Joe Russo. He's from the Hilltowns. Uh, also a Marine. Boy, this place is like full of Marines. Which, yeah, which isn't easy for these Navy wow. guys. Oh yeah, Dominic too. <laughs> Just a minute. But anyways, um, our job is to be that first person that the returning veteran connects with. Don is now gone, right? Okay, it's too bad because um, when he got in trouble, the person that he ended up connecting with after he got into probation, at least that, was his veteran service officer, who then got in touch with Kevin Lambert, who then went to see him when he was in jail. We are the first person many, many times that a returning veteran will see. This presentation on Battle Line, because I'm not a combat veteran, I was in during peacetime. This presentation is really good for me to have witnessed and been part of it. I've seen it a few times, and I know the guys who put it on. Because it makes it easier for me to understand that when I'm in my office, and a young guy comes in and says, hey, where's the veteran service officer? And my secretary goes, well, he's in his office. He's with him. I want to talk to him. You can't. They're in trouble. They're in need. They're aggressive. They've got a lot of power behind them, a lot of pain, and a lot of motivation to get what they want. Going through this stuff, learning how returning veterans who have PTSD or traumatic brain injury, how they will behave is really important for me so that I know they're not doing it. It's not a personal attack to me. It is, I need stuff. Somebody told me you were going to help me. I don't want to share my crap with you. I don't want to do any of that. Just tell me what I need. I want to get it and I want to get it now and get the hell out of here. As probation officers, you might face some of these same people. And the hard part is going, okay, we, you have some power over them, just like I do. I have the power of the purse, I have the power of different things. But what I guess the presentation is to help people understand that if you haven't done military service and you weren't in combat, it's going to be really hard to understand why somebody is that aggravated at you, coming out too strong, or completely shutting up and not even helping themselves. It's helped me do my job to understand that, and hopefully having these presentations and trainings helps all you folks do your job when it comes to these veterans. When somebody comes in, why would they come to see me? Well, I do a few things, and when I said uh, how many people I assist, I run a financial benefit program for indigent veterans. So if they're out of work, they came home and they went on unemployment, the unemployment ran out, they still can't find a job because we've got such a great economy, and they're not congressmen. Then I go to assist them. They have qualifications they have to meet. If they can't get something from me, my job is to really work hard to find out where I can get them help. So what I want to just relay on to you folks is that there are options out there. There's a lot of things that can be provided for veterans. If you have a veteran who comes in 
and there's issues with the law, but then you find out there's also issues with housing, there's also issues because he can't pay his rent, or he can't pay his electric bill, or, you know, his parents are like, you know, we're, we're done supporting you, get the hell out because you're making us crazy, or the spouse is like, you know, I need money from you to assist the kids, and, you know, it's all on me. All of those things that add pressure and tension to these returning veterans. I have a program that if they're in one of my 10 towns, I can give them the financial assistance to get them over the hump. And they ease them into the next stages and the next parts of their life. Okay? Massachusetts has a law, and it changed back in the early 70s. The regulation always was well, you have to be a Massachusetts veteran, you have to establish residency for three years, and then if you need us, we're there. Well, that was changed in front of the Massachusetts State Supreme Court. And actually, the one who brought suit was Western Mass Legal Services. They brought suit. They won. So now a veteran who comes into the state of Massachusetts and says, you know what, I like it here, I want to stay, is automatically a one-day Massachusetts veteran, Massachusetts resident. Okay? So if he ends up in the court on the day two, he'll be eligible to come and see me. <coughs> If he doesn't meet our qualifications, and this is the complicated thing, I won't go through it because I was at a meeting with the statewide homeless program yesterday. Um, we're forming a committee that's going to have a one sheet that's going to say if they serve these times, they get this. If they serve these times, they're out for this. Because it's really crazy. The BA help which Marie works through, um, has its own eligibility. And that eligibility changes before 1980 and after 1980. It depends on whether or not you work, served during wartime or not, how many days you served, and what your discharge was. Massachusetts Veterans Services, we have, you have to serve 90 days if you served during wartime. It doesn't matter where you served. You could have served in Honolulu in 1975 or 1989. If you served one day, well, not maybe 91, but, but if one of those days you served during wartime, even if you weren't in war and you did 90 days in the service, you would be eligible for veteran services. If it's during peacetime, 75 to 90, uh, there was a time before Vietnam and after Korea, you had to serve 180 days. That's all you have to have served and have either a general, I mean, an honorable discharge or general discharge under honorable conditions. So that doesn't fit the same way the VA does. So people who might be eligible for VA services may not be eligible for mine and vice versa. That's why I'm here as well as the VA. I want to make sure that people know if you're trying to help your veteran who's in trouble, just if they're not eligible for VA, doesn't mean you have to stop. That, that there's not something out there for them. You can also contact the local veteran service officer or members of the SAVE team, like the two gentlemen here, or a member of the SHARP team, and David Felty's back there. He is the one who deals with the homeless problem or veterans at the risk of homelessness. They will connect you with state services. There's one other thing that I wanted to say about veterans who are in financial trouble as well as potentially legal trouble. There is also a grant called SSBF, and that's Supportive Services for Veteran Families. It says veteran families, but a veteran of one can be considered a family. So if you have an individual veteran, or you have a veteran with a family, and they're in trouble both financially and with the law, they might not be eligible for me. They may not be eligible for VA help, but under SSVF, under that grant, the providers can take anybody who had military service, and it doesn't even matter. The only thing they cannot have is a dishonorable discharge. Anything besides that, they are still eligible. So those people are out there. Currently in Western Mass, we have two providers who do it, Soldier On, has the SSVF grant, and Veterans Inc. has most of New England, but they have a caseworker out here in Western Mass. 
Those are the providers. There is a lot of things that we're working on and trying to make the lives of veterans who serve this country better if they've gone through some of the things that they go through and end up with new problems. Um, Dominic is going to talk about one of the programs that they run. I, we've been doing in cooperation with the DA's office and a whole group of it's a great plan. What you're seeing now through the Valor Act and what we're trying to do is take that plan that District Attorney Sullivan had started a couple of years ago and try to expand it across the entire state so that veterans don't fall through the cracks. So I'm one of those components, I'm one of those people that are creating that safety net for veterans who are in trouble or a thing. So, um, like an idiot, I didn't want to carry too much stuff through the screen, so I left my briefcase behind with all my cards on. But I'm right in Memorial Hall. If you have anybody who lives along Route 9 and you know they're in trouble and you think I can help, please don't hesitate to call me. Um, at this point, I'll just, if anybody has any questions, I'll entertain any questions. Yes? Are, are you on the front line, so to speak, for referrals if a person's just coming out of Discharge. Yes, I'm often, the first person that, 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 that they should see. Yes, I'm the first person that they should see when they get released. Um, because I've gone to presentations for all the troops as they get off. And I was one of them. Where when you're getting discharged, you get somebody who goes up there and it's mandatory for that day that you sit and listen to somebody tell you all the benefits you're eligible for. And you get about 12 people who go up with PowerPoints and go, ah, 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 ah. and the person's going, my girlfriend's outside the gate. I haven't seen her in a year. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, my mom and dad. Or, I can't wait to see my kids. That's what they're thinking about. They're not paying attention to anything that's being presented to them. They just know they have to be there until somebody says you can go, and then they get to run out. So what happens is, is after they're out, I had a guy come to me. And he said, uh, I didn't know, I don't know if I get any benefits or anything. And I said, oh, well, you know, when did you serve? Well, I got out last year. Okay, how long did you serve? Oh, four years. I said, uh, didn't you go through a presentation? They tell you, oh, Christ, yeah, I got a thing on my kitchen table. I said, I never opened it. I'm like, oh. yeah, so these are the things. So what we ask is that any veteran who comes home, come to their VSOs and the veteran service officer can tell them what do they get and all of that. So yes, in answering your question, that's the first place they should go so that they can actually have the time to absorb the different things that they're available to. I had a Vietnam vet who, you know, was, had a great career or whatever um, for 30 years, but unfortunately had no retirement. So when he had to stop working, he was living on Social Security money of like $750. I can't live off of that, even as an individual. That person had a very rough life for about eight years until it got so bad he went and found me because somebody told him about me. And he goes, I'm sure nothing was available for me. I'm like, okay. Got him signed up for the VA. He has health care through them. He has an extra $500 from them. I provide him another $400 so that he can pay his rent, pay his utilities, and he's doing great now, but it's amazing. You know, he served in the late 60s, early 70s, and he never knew that there was things out there for him. That's why I go out and speak, because I want these people to know. Come, learn what's there for you, so that you don't have to go through a lot of the difficulties that people go through. Um, I usually don't drop names, but I guess now that he has passed, it's not I don't think I'm breaking any violations. But what I'm hoping is, is that the guys that you just saw present and the rough times that they went through, they have been fortunate. And I think the public is much more in tune with their needs and trying to address them rather than back at the end of Vietnam when people came back. They didn't get that same kind of feeling. They didn't get that same kind of stuff. And you ended up like people with James Foreman. How many people know who James Foreman was? Rock. Okay. All right. Troubled man his whole life. He probably spent more time in this courtroom than I have. And I used to have to go in here a lot. Okay. Um, 
we're trying to prevent the combat veterans of today not to end up like James, who had a tortured life most of uh, his life, and unfortunately passed away this summer. So this is why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, I love my work, but I'm, I guess I'm like the rest of you. I don't get paid enough, but I keep doing it anyways. Anybody else have a question? Okay, thanks. Quick, there's four slides. See you all Good afternoon, my name is Dominic Sandrini. I'm the program coordinator for the Veteran Justice Partnership, which, well, we end up, we end up in contact with people from across the state. Uh, started out as being in New Hampshire, Franklin, and Berkshire, and we started out doing it through uh, District, District Attorney Sullivan's office. Uh, Marie, John, is John still here? John Lutton, you're, I didn't know that I would have got a picture of you up on here. I'm trying to find it somewhere. But myself, Jim Zimbo, Marie McNeil, and John Lovell, John and Marie being the, the VA, VA part of the team, work together on the Veteran Justice Partnership. Right. Right, yeah. A lot of times we will cover for each other. If we have a veteran that has to go to court and they've been assessed, maybe under the Valor Act or had a connection with us some other way. We always try to have somebody be there with the veteran and support and just to help with the communication. And just so it's a little bit more of a smooth transition into treatment. And the program that we run is a collaboration between Soldier On, Department of Veterans Services, Department of Veterans Affairs, District Direct Vet, Department of Mental Health, um, among a vast array of probation officers, which if none of you end up contacting me after this, or Marie after this. Any of these probation officers who we've dealt with one-on-one, -on -one, you can ask them who we are and what we do. Uh, Steve Wheeler, John Jones, Sue Gallon, Corey Dion, Sarah Cohen, Lynn Dave Keehan, is that how you say Lynn's Dave last name? Dave Keehan. Uh, Janet Eli, Fitz Mako Chitara, Sean McBride, Margaret Oglesby, Lori Sheehan, Sean McDonald, Lori Clark, Mark Bruno, Stan DeLeo, Maribeth Costello, John Thorpe, Barry Boothalette, John Hart, Jason Harder, uh, Mike Murphy, Linda Trull, and um, Alf Barbalunga. And I know there's a couple other ones that I forgot in there, but did, we've come in direct personal contact with these different uh, probation officers. And if you guys have any questions about who we are, how we do what we do outside of this presentation, you're more than welcome to contact them. The, alternative sentencing program that we try to make available to the different courts. The way that it works is the vet ID is made by probation or the jail, or if the vet knows who we are personally, they can call in themselves. Um, we will do an in-person or over-the-phone assessment, whether or not the person is actually motivated to, on our end, the soldier on end, we actually have two physical locations, one in Northampton, one in Pittsfield, so we would work with you all to try and put together some kind of 
agreeable plan, and then the person, instead of going to jail, would come into one of our shelters. So the person's got to be agreeable to actually going into a shelter. Um, on Marie and John's end, they're doing a clinical assessment and then referring them into VA services. So you don't have to actually come into a, a shelter to be working with John and Marie. Do you want to say anything else about that? Right, sure. Just that, um, yeah, so if somebody is referred like by probation under the Valor Act, ultimately I'm doing the assessment, so I'm a clinical social worker. Um, sometimes we do have, there are veterans that are not eligible for VA services, so if that's the case, I always try to, you know, refer them to a community agency or sometimes, you know, with Dominic, we've been able to figure, figure out some kind of a plan for somebody so that they have some kind of treatment, because that does come up a lot. Um, and like I mentioned, yeah, we do try to have a presence in court when the person has the next court appearance. We're in contact with the attorney and probation department throughout the whole process. We actually go to the court with the, the person who's court involved, and then at the end of the year, we obviously end up with a, a diversion or a, a jail sentence, or conditions of probation that are something else. Um, I've got eligibility restrictions on here, and Steve just touched on it. The only thing I want to make sure that you all know is that for Soldier On, the people who we work with have to have had one day of active duty service in anything other than dishonorable discharge, which is a it's a big difference between what the VA's definition is, and it's not as big a difference with the, between us and the population that Steve and Joe deal with. But I think that I don't think there's anybody else who has more loose guidelines than we do. Um, the thing to keep in mind with that is that somebody who's been in the National Guard, Army Reserves, Marine Corps Reserves, Air Force Reserves, whatever, and was never federally activated, is not a veteran by definition of soldier on. Uh, Department of Veterans Services or the VA. So you have to have been active, uh, federally active. We'll provide you guys with monthly summaries of what's going on with the person if they come in. We do urines and breathalyzers, and we can do them at, at your request. And the GPA, yes, bracelet is not an issue for us, but if somebody needs to come in on one, the toll-free number, which I think, I, I know half of the people that are in here already and recognize you all and I've met with you all, but these little brochures here have the 866 number on here. And what's also, what Steve mentioned earlier, was the SSVF grant, which isn't something that's a court-related thing, it's a homelessness-related thing. But if you have somebody who comes into the court system who's homeless or at risk of homelessness, that 866 number that somebody would be calling to get in touch with myself, Marie, John, or Jim, is the same number that you'd be calling if somebody was homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, I have my cell phone on there, and I, I printed out some of these, but this thing's pretty big, so I don't think you guys need to actually have the slides in your hands. Um, but I always try to tell people when I get an opportunity, please hold me accountable. You know somebody who's in our program, or you know somebody who's working with Marie or John, and something isn't going quite how you think, or you hear something, or whatever, please call us because feedback from the outside is how we improve and get better. And typically, the things that we hear are good, but if there's something that's bad, then let us know. We want to know that it's happening. Any questions? That's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
the end of 4.30, but I think we're going to do it then some. So uh, I know Chickpea was pretty excited. I'm just um, <laughs> got to get back to the office. The work to do. It's not like, uh, it's not like war wrestling. It's not like what? War wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> I heard those guys were jerks. I don't know. I just thought I didn't have the same instructor you had. Um, just wanted to have you folks, if you haven't already started to look at your red packet, if you open up your red packet on the left hand side, what this is, again, if you haven't already looked at it, this is a listing of the veteran services officers throughout the Commonwealth. And this, I deployed twice. I deployed from a Londonderry unit, unit Londonderry, New Hampshire. For those of you who don't know, it's about 25 minutes north of the Massachusetts border. We had a lot of people who lived in Massachusetts. This was 2004, 2005 when I came back from Iraq. No one ever said to me, you have a VSO in April. I didn't know what it was. I went on my second uh, tour. I went to Kuwait for a year, came back. I learned about the veteran services officer because of a coworker whose wife worked in the veteran service office in Chicopee. I was just talking and he said, where's your wife? She told me where his wife does. And so I was like, how come I never knew about this before? But a lot of veterans, and I think Steve probably touched on it, and, you know, others have touched on it, but a lot of veterans don't know about a veteran service officer. They don't know about them. So uh, it's a great resource for you folks to have. If you have nothing else, if you're like, geez, I forgot everything that we have been told about you know, veterans and helping them out. If nothing else, please send them to the local veteran service officer. Because that's it's just such a great connection to make for a veteran. So again, listing of uh, those that are available throughout the Commonwealth. On the right-hand side of the packet, the pretrial diversion of veterans. This is sort of what I think was kind of that was sort of kicked off the So the Valor Act. So that's a memorandum from uh, Chief Justice Conley from 2012 about the Valor Act, and that probably most of you have already seen it. You probably have started to refer people and what have you for the Valor Act purposes. Uh, some people say, geez, it was too limited, but I'll tell you what, what a great step in the right direction the Valor Act has been, I think. brought a lot of notice to a lot of those of us who work in the court about trying to help veterans. Um, and I understand there's more legislation pending. Some more stuff. Valor Act 2. Yeah, Valor Act 2, so we're glad to hear that. So a further, further growth of that Valor Act. Um, towards the back of the right-hand side, we have some forms. When people come to the town or the district court, the criminal court, and at and Hamden Probate Court now, I don't know about some of the other courts if they're doing it too. But you ask the question, prior military service? Right, when you're doing the intake on them. What if they say yes? Then what happens? And that's sort of where these forms in the back of the packet come from. What if somebody says yes, I have prior military service? Well, that's great. Next question. But we can actually put that you know, to the side of a mind, finish the intake process. And this, these forms give us something to do with that information. Um, lost my train of thought. So at any rate, we have somebody who comes in. Oh, what I was going to say is, these are really kind of a proposal because to date we haven't seen statewide any sort of paperwork that says, here, do something with that veteran, do something with that information. This is an attempt to get us started. This is our first training as a committee. This is, uh, I know there have been other uh, veterans trainings that Diana has facilitated and so forth. But as a committee, uh, we kind of brainstormed, gone back and forth on what things we thought might help veterans. So the first page of this says, the individual says, yes, prior military service. And you'll see a term called point person. And we're proposing that every office have somebody who would be responsible when someone says, I am a prior service veteran. Uh, so every office might have, might be the chief, might be assistant chief, might be an APO, could be one of your staff support personnel who would then talk to the individual after they're done with their intake, perhaps when they're done with court, and they would complete something called a referral form. A referral form. Can I, can I just interject one Go ahead. That, that designated point person at, at, at best practices would be a, a, a veteran himself. Um, they that clearly be sought by our presentation. Veterans identify better with other veterans that have been through similar experiences. Um, if you do not have a veteran in your court that's available to you, you might have somebody on your staff that has a family member that's deployed or, or some, some vested interest in, in veterans or just or a very patriotic person that wants to help out. But I think 
thing when you're choosing that person, choose that person wisely because we want them to make that connection from, from the very second that that person walks in the door. Um, I know we all have busy courts, I know in the morning our intakes go down, down the road, but if you have that specific point person, you know, maybe take five minutes out of their time and go to an office area where, where, there's, where there's a nice place for an interview as opposed to the stressful situation in the hallway and where there's a lot of people compacted. Just kind of get that, that point person to take the interest, take that extra five minutes, take a step out, and then go on. Right? Okay. Right. Yeah. So, that person, um, point person can then take a hold of a referral form. And the referral form is pretty self-explanatory, just asking for their basic information, name, date of birth, social security number, uh, branch service, service dates, type of discharge they might have, um, any service-connected disability if they want to report one or not. A lot of this is voluntary. We have to kind of remember that as we're going through it. I had a gentleman uh, yesterday, 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 he um, started talking about disability and so forth. He didn't want me to submit the form. I can't make him submit a form. I can't submit this paperwork and try to get him some help. He's refusing to talk to him about it. Um, did the paperwork. I held on to the paperwork. If he comes back in and he says, geez, maybe I would like to be referred, I have the paperwork. But again, a referral form, and the purpose of the form is to try and get them connected to services. So the form is filled up. At the bottom of the form, we've gone back and forth on where this should go. We're trying to keep it as simple as possible. We're sending it at this point in time, we have the fax numbers for the Department of Veterans Services in Boston. The idea here is that the form gets sent in to the Department of Veterans Services. They receive the form and they say, I'll look that social security number up. They can verify the service, the type of service, any discharge, what have you. And then they can say they would be very, uh, eligible for these different types of services. At the same time, they're supposed to go to the federal agency, perhaps Marine, or one of our counterparts, a veterans justice officer, throughout the Commonwealth, and they would say, geez, this information now that we have it as the Department of Veteran Services, what can the state do for this veteran? They are simultaneously going to send the information to the VA for their review and intake process, I think is the term for it. So, at any rate, one place for us as a probation service to send the information, and from there, get routed out for further services if they're eligible for it. The form behind that is a response form. Now, you will get back either this form or a form similar to it from the Department of Veterans Services, kind of a handshake that says we received your referral. So, you refer somebody to the Department of Veterans Services, they will subsequently send you a response form saying you got it. And now you have paperwork that you can put into your folder, your file, and you can say we did this and we know that somebody's helping them out, or getting, getting them started for referring processes. At the same time, when they do come in the office, they do a referral form, you should be signing, or having them sign a release of information, confidential release of information. There's a lot of confidential information that can be garnered through the referral process. Um, and right now, the traditional OCP form is what we're proposing that we use. So again, do the referral form, um, they'll sign the release of confidential information, go away to response form. And additionally, we have a tracking sheet, might look to some of you like an old chrono. And that's just a matter if you want to have something in your file to kind of document what you did for that veteran. Because at this point, they're probably not on probation, right? They might have just come through. We think they're eligible for battle rack, we think they're eligible for the SAVE program, maybe they need to go to Soldier Run, whatever it might be. All we're doing here, as you can say on the form, sent the uh, you know, point person met with a uh, veteran and paperwork was uh, faxed into the Department of Veteran Services. Two days later or a day later, same day maybe, response form received from DBS, referred out for X, Y, and Z. Put that in the folder. Next time they come into court, judge says what's going on. We refer them, judge. We've done our piece and we think that they're getting these services uh, or that they're eligible for these services. So again, some forms to get you started. This has been a collaboration within the committee, trying to uh, decide what information is most relevant, what would be most helpful. We're trying not to make too much more work. We know it is more work, but we're trying not to make it so much that no one's going to want to do it. So we're trying to keep the things down to one form at a time. And uh, we would ask that the offices, as you learn more, as you go through the referral process, you get information back 
talk to the veterans subsequently. Whatever area that you're getting information from, feel free to contact Diane, myself, other committee members and say, hey, this is working great. Hey, this is not working great. This is where I think we can see some improvement. We'd like to see referrals made to other areas, whatever that might be. But right now, again, our first training, this is our first attempt to take that information. Yes, I'm a prior service member. What do we do with that? Well, here's, here's one stab at it. Uh, we think this is going to at least give us a good step in the right direction. And we're welcome, welcoming feedback, uh, looking at these as living documents so that we'll change them as, um, as a constructive criticism comes back from the field. Anything else? Um, I think one to know the battle act qualifications. The person does come in and you think they have battle act qualified, it's up to you to notify the VA and the judge of that status so they can determine whether or not they do in fact follow under the battle act qualification to get the assessment done. However, um, that's just keep in mind that it does not include anybody who does not you know, qualify for the battle act to be tied into services. And so that's kind of that's kind of uh, probably a bigger goal here in the, in the, with the community is you know the battle act people already have some kind of a protection within the court system, but we want to reach all those veterans that do not call on the battle act um, by simply saying, look at, we have an option here to get you tied into services regardless of what they are, substance abuse, you know, violence, mental health, homelessness, um, insurance. We have the ability to get you tied into services. We're going to tie you into another veteran who's going to be working with you just to let you know it's a bill. It's, we're not, you know, we're not asking for the move. The move is <coughs> the referral here to make that tie in between us and that are here to serve us. Um, we just, it's just hard to be aware of all the services that are up there. Yeah, there are so many. We're so fortunate today to have all the different services uh, available to veterans. Um, I took a class up here at New England School of Architecture Woodwork, and there was a veteran from Vietnam. He hugged me. He's like, you're a veteran? And he was leaving, and I was like, yeah, I'm a veteran. And he's like, oh, it's just, uh, how you doing, man? I'm a Vietnam. I was like, wow, you know, he really needs help. <laughs> really felt like he might need help. But, they're out there, they want support, they need support. Um, they deserve support. They really do. One of my best stories, and we talked about, if they don't qualify for Ballarat, they might have qualified for something else. When I was working at JP, I had a 70-year-old Navy veteran. He did four years in the Navy. Um, I think it was between Korea and Vietnam, I forget exactly. Uh, four years, <coughs> he's like, Bob's ever in combat, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I knew he was having trouble with monies, having trouble with some healthcare issues. Uh, I got a hold of my co-worker's wife at the Veteran Service Office in Chickpea, she said, let me connect him to Northampton. And all of a sudden, he was gone. And I stopped making phone calls, where did he go? Well, come to find out, he had an infection, he was diabetic, they had to do surgery. He didn't have insurance, but the VA took care of him. He ended up in Jamaica Plain, and he was there for like two and a half weeks. They sent him back to Northampton for more follow-up. I mean, four years, 70 years old, his service was however many years ago. And still, the VA was there to help him out. And uh, he was very appreciative. And I know there are probationers who are veterans who had probation officers who referred them out for services, and they're very, very appreciative of any help we can give to them. So. Don Kearney didn't talk a whole lot about it today, but he was on probation with the Peel Out of Gloucester, and he attributes to this life being saved uh, by that process by the specific probation officer. He just uh, wouldn't say no, he wouldn't give up on it. He subsequently went to all his, every different court that he went to and met with every judge. And Talk to him about the progress that he's made. I think he's, he's he's a great example of what we can do for somebody that comes through our system. And you know, we can take something that's been broken and, and, and it makes a difference. Um, I want to just turn my attention to Jason, who's been with us, playing these trainings with us for years. He's also a veteran. I know you might have some stories you might want to share about connecting in with veterans, or is that something you don't want to do? Uh, he's very often coming across veterans, and I'm going to put you on the spot um, that might not be valid or qualified, but just by indication of the tattoo or the way they're carrying themselves or the way they're looking. Yeah, and then, and again, the suggestion was made about a veteran. And you notice Don had his tattoos on his arm. I had a young guy come from the counter who had similar tattoos. He couldn't afford to pay his fees and fines. He was really angry. He was getting aggressive. And I said, have you contacted your, your veteran service officer yet? And he took a step back and he was getting angry. He said, how do you know I was in the military? And I said, I can see the tattoos. I know you were in the military. And we referred him to the local veteran service officer. I gave him Steve Connor's name in the event that that service officer wasn't uh, available. And the guy got some services. He was, he was having issues with domestic violence. That's why he was in the court. So just picking up on little cues like that. 
Uh, we had a Marine come through who uh, the, the PO circled, yes, he's a veteran. And he went right through the system. And he came to the counter. He pulled out his wallet. I saw the Marine Corps emblem on his wallet. Asked him you know, what, what his situation was. He was a combat vet. We referred him right over to the VA. We got Marie involved and, and got him some help. So it's just keeping little cues about uh, the tattoos. Um, and when they circle that yes box, uh, make sure you respond to it. We had a Vietnam vet who was uh, three OEYs. His whole record consisted of OEY cases. And uh, he was an unemployed guy. He had uh, a third OUI. Took him in my office, we called Steve Connor, we got him in touch with the VA, he went through the post-traumatic stress ward after you know, three tours of Vietnam and four years later, he ended up getting 100% disability, he got uh, connected to service connected disability, so they took care of him financially, they were taking care of him uh, medically. So it's not just the current veterans, anybody who served as yes as a veteran can be referred for help. Any other questions, comments? I know uh, during the presentation they talked about something that you're absolutely not saying when you're dealing with a veteran. I know um, from my experience or some of my experience with dealing with veterans over the past few years, a um, very good thing to say when somebody indicates that they're a veteran is to simply thank them for their service. Uh, thank you for your service. When a mom or family member might say um, that they have somebody being deployed, instead of saying, oh my God, I need a, I need a straight jacket, you could say, geez, you really must be proud. Um, if you have somebody in your office that it has served or, or is, 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 has a family member that served, you might as an office might want to step up and say, hey, how can we help you? You know, you can offer babysitting services, you could offer car food rides, you could offer baby, um, you know, meals. Um, but let's not forget about our own community. We have a lot of probation officers, our brothers and sisters of ours that are, that are served and that we can also make a difference in, in helping. Question? I just kind of want to follow up on what I was saying. I'm a juvenile PO, and uh, I don't often have the opportunity to work with, with veterans because of the age of the that I work with. Uh, but in the last year, I've had four instances where the parents of my juvenile were veterans. Yep. Um, this is not this is not division. You're right. It's not just not division oriented. If we're talking about it, it's it's all of us. It's probate. It's it's the family issues. It's the children. It's the family that might be deployed. If, if we, as Americans, I mean, we we are all touched by it. By it. But you're right. It is tr it's trickling down to all our court services. And one thing that became abundantly clear to me as we started dealing with the veterans, they all want us because unfortunately this is where the veterans are we're finding our veterans because of all the issues that they're having with the post traumatic stress. So um, we are it. We are, we are the people that can make that link. And, and when I tell you, they salivate for our business. Everybody wants to be this person on the end of this form because everybody's got the, they've got the services available. They just want, they just want the bodies. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, any questions about the referral form at all? It's fairly self-explanatory. At the bottom, just, um, if you would just make sure you do fill in the office um, information at the bottom, just in case there is a Valor Act issue. They, we know who the defense attorney is and so forth. A couple other things we're going to touch on. Question. I have a quick question. So if someone comes in and you think that they could use some services, would you, would your first uh, response be to refer that person to a veteran service officer or to make the referral? Well, I would talk to them and see sort of where they're at with it. I would probably, I would pull the referral form out and start to work through it because I'm going to get some basic data from it, which I know we have a lot of it because we have, it takes a lot of time. Um, but I would stop that referral form. Um, they will verify what kind of discharge they got, which will dictate some of the services they get. If you start with, with faxing that form, I think we can filter through that. I do think it's important to have a relationship with your, with your um, local officer, seeing as everyone has one. But I think if you work in tandem, but I would say the first step would be to, to get that to get that paperwork from them. But but if they're not willing to sign that referral form, you know, absolutely okay. give that information to the VSO because you know what, they're gonna walk out the courtroom door, and you know, in Chicopee, it's it's two miles from the court to the Veterans Service Office. They're gonna go by it throughout the course of the day. Can I get right back to you? Did you have something gonna add? Well, to I just you? wanted to state that. If they're willing to sign the lease and allow that to be sent in, then there's somebody like David who's going to be in touch with that veteran pretty quick. Or if it's more of the judicial end, one of them will reach them. If they won't sign it, if they want to really think about it and say, well, I guess not yet.
that's when you say, yeah, take the name of your local get to that local veteran yeah. service officer, and then you can call that local veteran service officer and say, I'm sending a guy your way, I don't know if he's going to go, or a woman's going to go, but I, I got your name and I'm sending him to you. But I, I would still say the first way, because then you've got somebody quick who's going to go to them. Yeah. I'm also doing observation, and it's kind of clicking in with what she has, because we're dealing with, you know, now the new 17 to 18 year olds, because now we have them in juvenile court because the law changed, so it's going up to 18 now that we have them, so we could be getting into some of that we haven't yet in the court that I'm working in. But my concern, too, is that care and protection parents, it's probably about two-thirds of our business now in juvenile court. Delinquencies have gone down, the chins aren't there anymore, we have the CRAs now. Mm -hmm. So, we don't, they're really not the subject before the court, but they are a party right. to, so does that still cover them? What do you mean a party, but not the subject per se that's being I, Yeah, we believe that it does, and, and I will tell you that working in probate court, um, as, as the other day with the gentleman who I was gonna make a referral for, and he said, no, 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 I don't wanna be referred to. He was telling me that he was disabled, he had back injuries, uh, he had only a TAPC that he was receiving, and I said, if you're a veteran of the 214, we might be able to get you referred to the right place to get you some money to help get you going. That supports a family. You know, and, and again, with juvenile court, the same idea. We talked about this in committee. We're like, this is so critical in juvenile court. It's so critical in, obviously, in criminal courts, uh, family court. What if someone's homeless? How are they going to visit with the child? How are they going to, you know, so it's just, it's, it, it permeates the whole of what we do as a probation service. The one thing to remember is if somebody's getting TFA, TA, yeah, they're getting transitional assistance uh, and they're a veteran, you definitely want to make sure they get connected with the local VSO because our money is much better. <laughs> it is. We get it's much more. more green. It's a good reason. Very fast. But it tells us money is very fast. They will notify them if there are the different services that, that are required for the family or available for the family. That one contact person should be able to give you all that information. There is literally a book that's There's also the special branch for women veterans um, who are at risk of homelessness or in trouble to SSVM. So. Could you tell us anything about the gold star? I don't know if yourself or any folks share it. I don't know it's not a lot about the gold star, but gold star mothers, wives, husbands, you know, the, the family. There is a whole uh, network of supporting each other in those families. So if you 
if the person needs even more, they're not willing to even go to see me. They can go and find the local Gold Star uh, family outreach. There's one in the Chicopee area, I believe. Uh, they're not as big as they want to be as far as getting their name out there. But if you call the Department of Veteran Services, they can tell you who the Gold Star family supporters are out there. That's another option. There, there's, there's just so much. There's an entire website called um, Mass Vet Advisor. And of course, I didn't bring any of those, but we have it here. But it's a website, massvetadvisor.org. And it's like a Google search for veterans, for Massachusetts veterans. And all you have to do is type in what you're looking at. And um, whether it's taxes or benefits, you punch it in and it comes up with all the options. So, that's why it's really important to try to get them connected. We're not expecting everybody here to know all this stuff, just know how to access it to get it to the veteran or those who have a history of military service. So again, I, I, do you know what the Gold Star program is? Do you know I, did, I did read, um, I think it was the Senate passed the uh, Battle Rack 2, and the Gold Star was a section that was put into that where it enabled, uh, I think, a license plate for the mother and family members to be identified as the star. They lose the family in the uh, Yeah, and I had a woman in Chickpea when I was uh, working there. Um, she was on probation, but you know she was a Gold Star family member. Um, her, her husband had come home with some significant wounds, multiple surgeries. He deceased, and she became part of the Gold Star family program. So even again, if you're not dealing with a veteran directly, you might be dealing with a family member. And they might say, geez, you know, my husband, my child, whatever. They might be out, but I don't know a lot about the Gold Star program. It's, it's, there's not a lot of information I've come across on it yet, but I know that it's a program that's out there. There can be money available for families who might not qualify. So just another program as well. Anything further from anybody? I want to make sure that if everybody is clear in the fact that when, when a veteran comes to the counter and they serve with a yes, that they are a veteran, there's one more here. We have three questions to, to, to identify whether or not they qualify. One, if they have no past convictions, they have no outstanding warrants, and the offense that they're being arraigned on has to be a jailable offense. If they meet that criteria, they are eligible for the Valor Act. So the form that was made up is to be faxed to uh, Boston. Boston, in theory, would then reach out to the VA, to a Marie or whatever a session of state this person lives in, an evaluation would be done, it would be forwarded to the court with recommendations. But after you identify that individual as a veteran, the district attorney's office needs to be notified. So you need a contact with the district attorney's office and the defense attorney needs to be notified so that all parties are, are playing on the, uh, the same field and we know what's taking place with this veteran. The diversion is discretionary. Uh, I had a, a veteran that I worked with who was a friend of mine who was in the Worcester area the DA's office refused to go forward with the diversion and the judgment along with it. So it is discretionary according to the district attorney's office and the judge. So you need to make sure everybody's on the, on the same uh, playing field. And uh, we met uh, Marie, so once, that evalu once the evaluation is done, you mentioned you've been in touch with the defense attorneys to coordinate what type of care will be put in place or to make suggestions for treatment. But I just want to make sure everybody's aware of what we do when we circle that yes one. Now, I have not seen the form, but I know that it took an act of legislation in the state legislature to get the question not to ask if they are a veteran, but do they have a history of military service. So when we use the term veteran, that's us identifying it. But the question really is, do you have a, uh, a history of military service? Because what one, I had a veteran come in from World War II, had frostbite, lost toes, had all kinds of things. He was in the Battle of the Gulf, but because he never actually got shot, he didn't think he was a veteran. That's how bad it is. That's why we changed the language. Yeah, to a history of military service. So. Thank you for all of you for coming today. Thank you for yeah, our veterans that serve on our committee.